Every Sunday nights again uh, for the drive-in church there on Sunday nights. We we'll continue with that. So praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles tonight. Second uh, Timothy chapter one. Just a few thoughts before we come to pray uh, tonight. I wanted to speak on an unfeigned faith and a stirred-up gift. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 1 through to verse 7. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 1. Father, we thank you for your presence tonight in this place. We thank you for the testimony. We thank you for the thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of praise. Lord, in your house tonight, O oh God, we thank you that you're in the midst, O oh God. We thank you for the great work that you've done in each of our lives. For Judith, we give you praise tonight, yes, Lord. For it's good to remember what the Lord has done. And Lord, you've done great things in our life. We pray you'd bless her, strengthen her, continue to use her life for your glory in these days. Now, Lord, would you anoint us both to preach and to hear your word and your name to be glorified in this house tonight. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Second Timothy Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for, from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I pray, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother Lewis and thy mother Eunice, and I have persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, for God hath not given us, I wonder could we read this verse together. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Can we read that verse again, very apt for these days? For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the church said, Amen. We believe God's word tonight. You know, I just looking over these verses for the last couple of days, <coughs> trying to grasp for uh, just a second the heart of Paul as he's writing this letter to the younger Timothy, great, greatly desiring to see him. Paul wanted to be in the company of this younger man. He wanted to be in the company of his household. He longed to be with them. He <coughs> talked, as you see in the reading here, he talked of greatly desiring to be with him being mindful of his tears, that he would be filled with joy. In the life of the apostle, there was a place that he looked to go to. He, he was attracted to something in this young man, Timothy, that he wanted to be in his company. And what he was calling to his remembrance, as we read here tonight, is, this is what I remember about you. It's your own feigned faith. That's what I want to be in your company because when I'm there, there's a faith that I see in your life that causes me to be filled with joy. There's something about the faith that I recognize in you that was also in your grandmother and also in your mother. But that faith is something in all of the journeys that Paul was involved with and all of the difficulties that he would encounter and the oppositions and the shipwrecks and the beatings and the imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. But there was a place we see here that he wanted, there was a company that he wanted to be in. And he looked at it and said this was a place that he found that in this, this man's life, Timothy, he found that there was an unfeigned faith. And that word just for you to know if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, you know, it's obviously the word, the root word is feigned, which that word feigned means to be fake or to be false. In other words, what Paul was saying, there was such a sincere faith in your heart that I wanted to be in your company. It so encouraged me because there was a faith that you believed God and there was a sincere heart behind that. 
It wasn't fake or phony. It wasn't just babbling words. It wasn't just something that you said or a head knowledge. But I recognize it that it was in the life of Timothy. And he says, I remember that there's a genuine faith in your life. And brothers and sisters, the opposite to faith, many would say is unbelief. And I, I know that's true. But really, the opposite of an atmosphere of faith is an atmosphere of fear. And we are living in, in a world presently that is being driven completely by fear. That is what is being driven by our society, our world, our nations, our governments. Every aspect of our governments are being driven not so much by science. They're being driven by a spirit of fear. It is tangible. It is in the workplace. It is in our shops. It's in our streets. It's in every aspect of society. And you know, I believe tonight that when we come together, as we are meeting together as God's people tonight, it's a wonderful thing to experience the sincere faith in Jesus Christ together in God's house. There's a different atmosphere when God's people come together. And the reason it's different is because Jesus is here. He drives back the fear. He takes away all doubt. And we can put our faith and trust in Jesus tonight with that to Timothy. In the previous letter, 1 Timothy chapter 1, we see here that he uses this word on faith. It's only used about six times in the New Testament. But we see here in some context that he, he, he uses it and then gives you the opposite of what it looks like. So then he says here um, in verse 3, 1 Timothy 1 and 3, As I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine neither give heed to fables or endless genealogy which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith and, and so do this and verse 5 then it says now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart out of a good conscience out of a faith there he says unfeigned this is, this is what it is, he said. Don't teach anything else. This is the life I want you to live. Love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And then he says, look what he says in verse 6. From which some have swerved, have turned aside on the vain jaggling. Now if you look at the meaning of what that is, in our modern term, language, it just simply means waffling. That's, that's basically what that actually means. It means some have turned away from the sincere faith in Jesus Christ. And what they actually do is they just waffle. There's no substance in what they're saying. They're waffling about what they're talking about. And they don't know what they're actually saying. Because he says in verse 7, They desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. In other words, Paul's actually saying, as we would say, they actually don't know what they're talking about. But they talk a lot. And so he said, this is the opposite of this, this unfeigned faith. A feigned babbling, a waffle, just something coming from our mouths. But thank God tonight that God's put a faith in our hearts. And we can believe God in these days with a sincerity that God's completely in control of everything that's taken place. Jesus is on the throne. He is in control of the nations. We are rapidly approaching Whatever men may say, whatever you hear all around, we are rapidly approaching the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that the world is in turmoil. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith in the earth. But the Bible also tells us that in those last days, men's hearts will feel them. What for? Fear. And it's everywhere. You know... It, I don't know about you, but I just try not to listen to too much of it. You know, you try maybe to get the headline, but once it goes beyond that, to listen constantly to what they're saying, it's driven, it's driven by fear. And what fear does with people and what we're heading for is that it's going to bring a complete control of our society. It's like the whole of society wants suddenly to be controlled by government. Everything what they say, everything of what they do, we're all going to fall into line as a society and we'll just follow suit. And so the headlines, I was sharing with Andy and Ruth just before the service there, the headline two days ago is, 
100,000 people are going to die in the second wave in the United Kingdom this year already. Yes. They're driving out the fear into the hearts and they're saying who's the most vulnerable and then those people are driven into their homes in isolation and they don't know where to turn, they don't know who to turn to, they're hearing it in the radio, they're seeing it in the newspapers, they see it on the streets, they see it on the TV. Thank God tonight, friends, we don't have to live under the power of the spirit of fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so our whole lives are dictated to, not by what's happening on the TV, not what's happening from Downing Street or any other government office. Our lives must be dictated by God's word. And here Paul is saying, there's a place that I want to go. And I tell you, friends, I'm glad that they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I'm glad that we can come through the doors tonight, lift up the name of Jesus, hear the testimonies, the appreciation from hearts of what the Lord has done in their lives. There's an atmosphere of faith in God tonight in this place. And this is where I would rather be. In God's house, amongst God's people, Amen. with a sincere heart and a faith in God that wants to worship the Lord because there's nothing like the presence of the Lord. Amen. And Paul said, there's a place I want to be. And I don't know what all was going on in his life at this time, but we have read of, of the account of Paul the Apostle and the life that he lived for the Lord. He willingly gave his life that he would know this Christ, but to preach this gospel. And we know what he went through. But he knew there was a place that if I got to that place, I know I could bask in that fellowship, enjoy that fellowship one with another. I knew that there was a house that I could go to, that not only did Timothy have that on that, that on faith, faith, but I seen that same faith in his grandmother, and I seen that faith in his mother, and because they had that faith, Timothy seen the life that they had lived, so he was living the life that was set, the example that was set before him. And so when we come into God's house, thank God this is a house of prayer, and it's a house where God dwells, and we have a faith, a genuine, sincere faith in the Lord. Paul wanted to be in the company of a people of a sincere faith in God. That's where we want to be, isn't it? And amongst the people who are going to believe, believe with each other for all the needs that are being presented tonight that we say amen because we're going to pray for those needs. We're going to lift up those needs before the Lord. We're going to agree together for what people are bringing before the throne of grace. And we need a touch of God. We need God in our lives. We need an intervention in our home. We need a touch on our bodies. There's a sickness in our house. There's a financial difficulty in our home. So we come to the place of prayer. But what's in that place and in our hearts is a sincere faith to really believe God. We're here to believe God tonight. Yeah. We're actually here to believe the Lord, but to agree together for the needs that are on this page, the needs that have been mentioned. And I know I'm looking down at other needs that haven't been mentioned tonight. But friend, listen, there's a faith. Is there a faith in your heart, sincere faith, that you're willing tonight to believe God for that touch in your life? To believe God for that intervention in your home. Would you say amen if you do for me? Amen. So there has to be a faith, an unfeigned faith, a sincere faith in believing God. That we're not weak in our faith, but that we are, we stagger not at the promises of the Lord. And we know that what he said, he's also able to do. That's the God that we serve. What he said he would do, he is also able to to do it. You know, Jeremiah says, and the prophet Jeremiah says there, that the Lord is the mighty one and there is absolutely nothing that's too hard for him. And many people believe that. That there actually isn't anything too hard for the Lord tonight. That's what his word says. So as Abraham is told of him, that he staggered not at the promises of the Lord and that the true faith in him, he believed that what God was able to do, that he would do it. And so there's a sincere faith in our hearts to believe God. So Paul saying, I want to be in that environment of faith, that sincere faith. And Timothy, you've got that faith. And I've seen it in you. And I've seen it in your grandmother. I've seen it in your mommy. 
And now I want to be part of what that fellowship is. And you know, you see that in life. So you often see that. You see that example of faith. And people follow in to that example of faith and living for the Lord. And then he says these words in verse 6. He says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up <clears throat> the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You stir up the gift of God. Now, just in the previous letter, 1 Timothy 4 and 14, it says there, again writing to Timothy, he said to Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. In other words, there was a time, there was a period we don't know exactly when it happened, but we know it happened because the Bible tells us it happened. That when there was a meeting in that house, whatever age Timothy may have been, that there was a time of prayer. And as they prayed, the elders within that church, they went over and they laid hands on this young man. And as they laid hands on this young man and they prayed for him by the power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost imparted into that life, the Holy Ghost imparted in that man, the Holy Ghost imparted into that life a gift that God had given to him. And now that gift is in this young man who has a sincere faith in God, but God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has put a gift in his life. I want to encourage everyone in this room tonight who's saved. Do you know that God has placed gifts in this whole body and in every individual that's saved in this room tonight? Do you know that God, the resurrection gifts, the ascension gifts that are there, the fivefold ministry, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit of God. We know that not, not only is there the, the gift, the great gift and the wonderful gift of salvation, but then there's the gifts of the Spirit of God that God places in the body for the purposes of the edifying of the whole body. And so tonight, here Paul said to Timothy, now listen, God's put something in you. Can I encourage everyone in this room? You, you need to hear it because God has put, put a calling in every life in this room. And God has put giftings in every life in this room to be used for his glory. And now Paul is saying to Timothy, who has the faith in his heart, he says, Timothy, this is what I want you to do. Don't neglect that gift of God. Don't be careless. You know, there's many things where often can be careless about but he's saying here listen see this gift that's in your life don't be careless about the gift of the calling of god the gifts in the calling of god are without repentance god gives them in to that body and here's what he says he says i want you to do something with that gift he says would you stir up the gift of god he puts the onus on timothy through faith in his heart he said what i want you to do is i want you to stir up that gift that's in your life. It could be a gift of intercession. It could be a gift of prophecy, of faith. It could be a gift of tongues. But he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stir up the gift of God that's in you. And Frank, can I ask you tonight, is the gift stirred? Is it stirred? Do you know that? That simply means the stirring up is to re-enkindle. In other words, it has it, in some ways, has it, like a fire, has it nearly gone out? There's just maybe some smoke. But where there's smoke, there's fire. Isn't that the old saying? And maybe it's gone out and maybe there's not much fuel. And you know what it's like in the morning when the fire's been lit the night before and you're getting up and it's cold and you're hoping that there's still a bit of heat left in the fire. You get into the room and you see that it's nearly all gone and you begin to put the wind on it. You begin to give it a bit of a rake. And then you see the amber starting to come again. Then you get a wee bit of fuel on it. And the next minute the fire stirred up again. And there's heat coming. And friend, I encourage you tonight, like Paul has said, stir up the gift of God that is within you. Stir up the gift of intercession. Stir up the gift of miracles and prophecy and tongues. Stir the gifts in the body of Christ. Stir them by the wind of the Holy Ghost. This is what Paul is saying. There's gifts in the body that we've neglected, but we must stir them by the power of the Spirit of God. In 1 Peter 4 and 10, this is what it says. 1 Peter 4 and 10. Just in case someone's thinking, what gift do I have? But this is what the Bible says. 1 Peter 4 and 10. Every man hath received the gift. 
Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Every man has received the gift. There's a gift by the power of the Holy Spirit that's been placed into your life and in the body when we come together. Think about it for a moment. If the wind of God blows across the body of Christ and all the gifts are all stirred and awakened by the power of the... What would that look like? Wouldn't it be a, a wonderful thing to see all the gifts of the Spirit operating in the order as God has set it? To see the stir of the gifts, to see the prayers, to see the intercession, to see the prophecy, see the words of knowledge, the words of wisdom, the power of the Holy Ghost moving, every heart stirred by faith in God, and God moving by the power of His Spirit. That's what Paul's saying, stir up that gift. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and 4, 1 Corinthians 12 and 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but it's all the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but it's the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. And so we see it here again in Romans 12. We could turn over. Romans 12 and verse 5. It says these words. So we being many. Romans 12 and 5. So we being many are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another. Having then gifts. Differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry that is weighed on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheer, cheerfulness. And so we see here there is the gifts in the body differing according to the grace of God, but they all operate on the proportion of the faith that every one of us has received by God's grace into our lives. And so here's, here's two things tonight that I want to leave with you. An unfeigned faith. It's a simple faith in Jesus. That who he is, he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He that cometh to him believes that he is and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To believe God together tonight. And number two, to stir up the gift that is within you. Friend, maybe, maybe tonight... The gift is dormant. Maybe it looks as though it's just all buried under a whole lot of stuff. But can I encourage you tonight? Do you know the best way it is to stir up that gift? To get to your feet. To thank the Lord for saving you. To begin to open up the well. To praise the name of Jesus. To allow the Spirit of God to move in your life afresh. Allow the stir of God in your heart. When you think of the goodness of Jesus. Your heart begins to melt your faith in God. And suddenly, friends, as you begin to open your mouth and step out in that simple faith in God, then suddenly that heart is stirred and the gift is stirred. Do you know what happens when you do that? Here's what happens. The rest of the body are encouraged. Amen. How many times have you been in church and maybe not feeling necessarily on top of the world and you're sitting there, but then someone has got up and shared something and you're so thankful that they shared it or they prayed it or they opened their hearts. What has it done to you? It's encouraged you. And you're encouraging one another when we do it. So I encourage the whole body to say, listen, tonight to step in together, to stir up the gift of God, to give God thanks tonight. And let's believe together for the great needs that there are in this house. God is able Paul saying, oh, I tell you where I want to be. I want to be with the people that are going to believe God. I want to be with someone that's going to say, listen, you know, like that, that man with the son who was deaf and dumb and throwing himself in the fire and they didn't know what to do with him and they brought him to Jesus. And Jesus says, if you only believe, all things are possible. And that's the answer tonight is a faith, a simple, sincere faith that what God said he is and who he is, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. And to stir up that gift in our hearts to believe God together. We just say amen if you believe it. Amen. So I want us to pray tonight. I want us to encourage one another tonight. 
I want us to believe God tonight. And I want us to pray that God would stir up those gifts in each of our lives together tonight for the encouragement to edify the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Let's believe the Lord together tonight. And let's pray and seek the Lord and bring these needs to Him. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, we do pray for your help. Lord, we pray that you would come by the power of your Spirit. And Lord, that you would move in this meeting. Lord, that you would come. Lord, even for those lives that, Lord, even in some senses they feel that, Lord, that there might be just a, a dwindling down of that fire. But, oh God, I thank you for your great love and your great mercy. And I pray, Lord, to be a stir up, Lord, of the gift. Oh, Father, we pray. Lord, I pray, Lord, to be a blaze, set, set a blaze, set a blaze for Jesus tonight, Lord. Lord, I pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that I even those that are feeling pressed down, Lord, and perhaps empty with the cares of this world. Oh, I thank you for your great mercy. Lord, would you come tonight in this meeting and would you touch lives afresh? Lord, I thank you tonight, Lord, that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And oh God, even those maybe perhaps struggling in this meeting tonight, even with fear. Oh God, tonight we give you thanks and we give you praise. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch them by your great power tonight, Lord. You would deliver them, Lord, from fear tonight, Lord, that put their faith afresh in Jesus tonight, oh God. Oh, Father, would you cover us, Lord. Stir up every life in this room tonight. Lord, we give you the glory and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.